Welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and start. Nice to see you all. So we'll start with refuge in Bodhicitta to set the motivation. Sange churon sogi churon lai janjo padu dane kapsuchi dagi churon yan ge pe sonam ge drola penche sange drupa sho sange churon sogi churon lai janjo padu dane kapsuchi Dagi chanyan ki pe sonam ki rola penche sange drupa sho sange churan sogi chunam la janchu padu dane kapsuchi dagi chanyan ki pe sonam ki rola penche sange drupa sho letting that motivation connect Okay, so it's nice to see you folks, and uh, today we're going to be doing similar to the previous weekend where we are going to zero in on one deity and their related practices, but use it as a platform to look at things that are in common with a lot of other practices. So today is going to be our Tara day and tomorrow our Tara day. Um, today we're going to be doing the practice of the short green Tara um, practice, which is maybe three pages long, four pages long. It's just a really sweet, very powerful, very deep practice that you can do, you know, in a 10 minute way or a 20 minute way on your own by yourself, just going through the text. It's just a beautiful practice. So I'll walk you through that today. And we'll talk about some aspects of Tara. And then tomorrow we'll do the Tara Puja, which takes more like an hour, hour and a half, a whole bunch of um, smells and bells, all sorts of accoutrement, um, but it's something that you probably do together at your Dharma Center, at least sometimes. And so um, I think it's helpful to unpack that. So as per your request, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, fire pujas and a little bit about stupas, holy objects, and how to fill and consecrate them and what that's all about. So those were really fun suggestions. So we'll kind of supplement what we're talking about with a little pivot into those. So today um, we'll look a little bit at fire pujas and tomorrow we'll look a little bit at invocation um, through the framework of consecrating and blessing and filling holy objects. So um, that's what we're up to today. Um, I thought to just kind of start with Tara basics that probably a lot of you know before I go into the practice, just to make sure we're on the same page with Tara and what she's about. Um, and so as I'm going through this and you're remembering things that other teachers or other readings you've come across have said, um, we can talk about those too and kind of collaborate. So for the next little section, I'm using this book by Andy Weber, and it's called Chittamani Tara and the 21 Taras, and it's how to draw them. So you wouldn't naturally think this is about the iconography and the details of the symbolism, but it actually has some really good stuff about that. So I really recommend this book by Andy. So he summarizes it as saying, Tara is a special deity a manifestation of all the Buddha's holy actions of body, speech, and mind. Therefore, she is called mother. By depending on Tara, one receives enlightenment. As all those who in the past have depended on this special deity, this manifestation of all the Buddha's holy actions have received enlightenment. So if we kind of zoom in on what Tara looks like, she has a lot of ornaments, which might be confusing if you're thinking about Buddhism in terms of austerities and giving up attachment. But what we're looking at here is a Sambhogakaya form, which is not perceivable to ordinary sentient beings. You need to have realized emptiness to be able to perceive these forms. And these forms are far more elaborate, but all of the beautiful details are not incidental or accidental or just for beauty, they all represent something really specific. So she has jewels all over the place, and those represent the six perfections. 
the necklace shows the three types of generosity, the anklets and armlets, discipline and ethics, et cetera, et cetera. So she's got earrings and bracelets and anklets and necklaces and a crown and all sorts of things. And all of those um, ornaments represent the six perfections. So you're remembering that the six perfections are generosity, ethics, patience, a joyous effort, concentration, and wisdom, those practices and aspirations of a bodhisattva. So already we see there's a tie-in to the things that you've been learning just in philosophy class and tie-ins into the practices you've been doing every day. So then she's green, which represents the wind element and indicates the speed through which Tara responds. And this is emphasized also by the leg out. So the leg out, as opposed to in the traditional meditation posture, shows that she's ready to leap to the aid of sentient beings. So there's an aspect of wind, there's an aspect of ready to leap to the aid, there's the archetypal mother kind of vibe. We've got all of this tied into the iconography of Tara. So then zooming in on her hands and the palms of her hands in this artist's rendering have Dharma wheels, if you're wondering what's there. But basically her right hand shows the gesture or the mudra of fearlessness and granting refuge. Her left hand shows the gesture or mudra of bestowing blessings and guidance. So emphasizing these two particular qualities of Katara, which of course all Buddhas have, but it's showing that she emphasizes those two. And then particularly this hand, she's holding the stem of an Utpali flower between her thumb and ring finger. And this shows knowledge of the three times, past, present, and future. And the three fingers being up represents the three jewels of refuge, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And this also indicates her supreme enlightenment and the union of method and wisdom, having those two fingers together like that. So when we're looking at Tara, I think it's, it's important to realize that Tara's iconography is not just one artist's idea that everybody got excited about and then repeated. Okay, it wasn't like there was just some random Indian guy who was like, let's make the archetypal mother pretty and green. Let's do that. And everyone was like, yeah, let's do that. Okay, it's this, these images actually come from enlightened minds, and they reveal themselves to practitioners who are at a level of karmic purification and realization development to be able to see them. Or if we're kind of of a skeptical nature and feel kind of like, what? We can just kind of put it aside in the maybe category. But I think it's, under, it's important to understand that this is not art. Okay, these are like mandalas, they are mind maps of realizations. They're ways for us to organize our meditations and anchor our focus on things that are virtuous. So whether you know the meaning of Tara's iconography or not, the image has power because of the mind that created it. Yeah, which is where we get confused sometimes with some of the lamas explaining about how certain mantras or images have power from their own side, because that seems to go in contradiction to the teachings on emptiness where nothing exists from its own side. So we'll hear things like, through the power of the mantra, if you walk underneath this mantra, it purifies eons of negative karma. And you're like, wow, I should just spend all day going back and forth under the doorway with this mantra, right, done. But of course, there's always a fine print, yes. And the fine print is with what kind of motivation, with what kind of receptivity you need to be doing these things, but also what kind of mind created them, both directions. And because of the meeting of those two things, there is power, even in the simplest thing of looking at a mantra that's very pure and directed towards particular things. So it's not like inherently from the side of the image, it has power. Dependently, it has power from the side of the image. Does that make sense? It's just who is it that made it, loads it with more merit. Yeah. So it's, it's just something to sit with and kind of 
work around in your brain how that would be. But I think we understand how there is energy of images because of the people that create them. And then also because of the people that interact with them, like the image of a heart or the image of a swastika, right? Whether it's good or it's bad, the meaning these images have comes from the people that created them and from the people that meet them. And if you're a small child who doesn't have a relationship with images yet, you're just seeing pictures, it doesn't have the same impact on your mind as it would if you'd been taught about it. And this is how it's different with holy objects and mantras. Holy objects and mantras have power even if you don't know what they mean, even if you've not been introduced to the concept. But it's a similar idea that the image has weight. Yes, because of the mental energy that went into its creation. Do you have thoughts about that or questions about that? So does it matter if the image you have is in black and white? So, I don't think so. Yeah, because the image is still with the sacred symmetry. You'll see that there's a graph or sort of an outline underneath the picture where it's very precise um, proportions, very precise proportions. And so the artist's rendering will differ, differ artist to artist in like slight subtleties of the shape of the face or slight subtleties in the positionings of like how, uh, I don't know, how squishy their cheeks are or how thin their cheeks are or how squishy their elbows are or how thin their elbows are. And those will be culturally dictated and related to the artist who made them. But the positioning of things and like the angle of the head and this hand being here and this hand being there, that's gonna be the sacred geometry and the sacred outline and the proportions that came from the enlightened mind. So that's my reason for thinking it probably doesn't matter if it's in black and white, but we'd have to check with a, a llama or a tonka painter <laughs> to be sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, if you've ever done a tonka painting class, I think it's quite an interesting thing to get to do because it can really uh, help with your visualizations. And they say that uh, the face of the Buddhas you create is going to be similar to how you look when you're a Buddha. So that's kind of cute too. Tara being green, I think sometimes confuses older students who have studied about the five Buddha families. And each Buddha belongs to a certain Buddha family related to the practices and energies that that family emphasizes. So Tara belongs to the Padma or Lotus family of Amitabha, who is red. And so you might think, but she's green. Isn't green related to Amoga City? And her green is related to wind, which is related to Amoga City. And it can make you sort of perplexed. This is kind of intermediate advanced student confusion. You new students, now I'm making you confused because you haven't had this conversation yet, right? <laughs> so intermediate advanced students. It's important to realize that the head of the Buddha family they belong to can be found in the top knot. So the top knot of Tara has Amitabha who is red. And you can kind of see it um, if you zoom and zoom. Can you see little Amitabha there, right in the crown? And so some artists are nice enough to actually draw which Buddha family they belong to in the crown ornament but usually it's just a gold nub. So that's because our art artists have trouble painting so very, very tiny, right? But even if it's just gold without a Buddha in there, know that in the practice there will be. So within the practice, the way you'll know which Buddha family they belong to is when you look at the invocation and empowering section, where there will be something about the five Buddha families are invited with so-and-so as their principal together with their retinue. So it will say like in Chenrezig Sadhana and Tara Sadhana with Amitabha as their principal together with their retinue. And that's how you'll know it belongs to the Amitabha Buddha family, which is the Lotus family. Fun facts about colors. Okay, so I, I guess it's important to realize with all of these deities that there are layers of meaning and layers of who they are. So with any deity, there's gonna be sort of the historical representation of a real life person, a real life human 
who embodied those qualities and characteristics in a very dominant and obvious way and had a significant impact during their lifetime to their disciples. So a person that was Tara. There's also going to be a person who is Medicine Buddha and a person who is Chenrezig, right? So there's, in all deities, there's a person who very much embodies the archetypal energy of the deity. And they get kind of cast as, this is Tara. But aside from, or together with, I should say, together with the human person that is the deity, there's always going to be the archetypal energy of the deity that any deity or Buddha can embody. So it's almost like the way in which if you're looking after a group of children, say you're a substitute teacher, okay? If you're a substitute teacher and uh, you have a classroom full of 15 kids, you have to bring different aspects to different kids, don't you? But it's all you. So some of the kids respond well to a humorous teacher who makes things light and playful. Some students need you to be strict and firm and a little bit direct. Some students need a lot of nurturing and warmth, but they're all qualities that you as an adult have, right? Just a normal grown up adult with basic mental health, right? You have the ability to kind of shift form based on the needs of the children. So the Buddhas are like that, where they can shift form based on the needs of us, their disciples. And so they take the form of Tara or take the form of Medicine Buddha or take the form of Chenrezig to suit the minds of various disciples. They themselves are not trapped or confined in form. It's a little bit like the Dharmakaya mind of all of the Buddhas is like the ocean and the forms that they take are like the waves. So it's made of the same stuff, but it's taking a form that's identifiable, but it's just for our sake to be relatable. Also for us to direct our minds in a specific way. So when we're doing practices related to Tara, we're kind of getting into the slipstream of energy to do with action and protection action to work swiftly for the welfare of sentient beings, to not overthink, to not get trapped or tangled in analysis, but just act the way a mother would act to pull her child out of traffic, right? Just right in the moment. They're not ruminating like, I don't know, I wonder if I should, you know, you just go for it. So sometimes you need your analytical mind to pull things apart and put them back together in a correct way. But sometimes you can get trapped in analysis and stuck there. So when you're connecting with Tara, you're sort of freeing up your energy to respond with your intuition, but not your animal basic instinct intuition, but your elevated intuition that's been conditioned by your practice to just act in alignment with what you've integrated and learned. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then you get the 21 Taras and the 21 Taras that we do our praises to sometimes in Sadhana practice, but definitely in the Puja, the 21 Taras are emanations of Tara, emanations of Chidamani Tara, who is the highest yoga tantra form of Tara. And the 21 Taras you can think of them as individuals who embody specific traits like the eight medicine Buddhas, or you can think of them as all uh, emanations of the one person or the one being. And both views you will come across, and there's an argument for both views. But what you're talking about really is, here's the main Tara, Chittamani Tara, and from her heart emanates a Tara for this specific purpose or that specific purpose. And they're all related to swift action and protection, but it might be swift action, protection, and healing, swift action, protection, and ending war, swift action and protection and stopping floods. You know, so there's like a pinpointed emphasis. And when you do the praise to the 21 Taras, you're kind of bringing together the power of all of the aspects and the whole spectrum of like Tara-ness, if that makes sense. So we'll go through each of those 21 Taras tomorrow, but they, it's a really interesting thing to have a look at. And um, I won't be able to give kind of a full 
giant kind of uh, explanation of all 21, but there actually are two really solid commentaries already available for free online. One is by Geshe Dawa, and one is by Lama Lundrup, and uh, Mary Ellen will send you links uh, down the track for those two. They're free, but they're really solid, accurate commentaries that I really recommend. Um, one of the best Tara books for modern people who are Westerners who don't necessarily like a new age gloss on their Tantra, but do want it to be accessible and conversational while still traditional. If that sounds like you, you will like uh, How to Free Your Mind by Venerable Tipton Children. How to Free Your Mind. So that's all about Tara in a really accessible way of um, learning, but also from good traditional sources. How to Free Your Mind. Okay. So we're gonna do the sadhana now. And before we do the sadhana, I wanted to just highlight a couple of parts because the first time you do it, it might not be obvious from reading it how to visualize. So some people by reading words automatically visualize, some people just wanna see a picture, right? So um, we'll try and hit both learning styles. So in the first part of this practice, and you'll get sent this practice soon, you're going to visualize and connect with the guru. But the guru is going to be in the aspect of Lama Tsongkhapa. So the guru, whether you have one or not, you're thinking about the teaching energy that speaks to your own wisdom. So whenever you hear the guru, of course, it helps if you have an actual guru. But here you're seeing Lama Tsongkhapa as like the representative of all good Dharma teachers, all Mahayana gurus. So he's the representative, he's also the embodiment. So if you don't yet have a teacher, what you're trying to do is really synchronize with those moments in your life where someone else's information touched your heart, not just your intellectual heart, mind, when it's been that very deep conveyance of knowledge where it had the ring of truth, where it spoke to your own wisdom, where it almost sounded like something you already knew but forgot. When you've had those moments in teachings with whoever, where the combination of your receptivity, their skill, and your karmic connection between each other meant that you were able to shift not just intellectually, that, that feeling, right? That pathway of knowledge conveyance is like the guru-ness, right? It's the Buddha's reaching for you through whatever person is in front of you all the time, of course, but specifically in the teaching scenario, specifically with teachers that have the qualities of a teacher, particularly ethics and the three higher trainings. So that quality of being able to hear teachings and trust your own wisdom's ability to recognize wisdom. You hear how much of that relies actually on you. You could have Shakyamuni Buddha in front of you in person and it not make any difference to your mind if you weren't open and receptive to him, right? If you weren't confident in your own ability to recognize wisdom. Do you, know, do you know what I mean, right? You have to be able to have confidence in yourself to hear the difference between wisdom and not wisdom, even when it's new content. And so that means the inner guru has to be linking up with the outer guru. And that whole dynamic and kind of an energetic form is taking the aspect of Lama Tsongkhapa. Because Lama Tsongkhapa was the most prominent figure in the Gaelic tradition because he took all of the teachings of the Buddha and put them in a nice tidy order and explained them in terms of the three scopes of beings and their ways of practice, which of course he took from Lama Atisha who clarified it in a summary form. Lama Tsongkhapa did it in a detailed form. So Lama Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, the Lamrim Chenmo is I think one of the greatest works out there in terms of the written word to help for development on the path. It's just, it's brilliant because it goes through harvesting important quotes and sections from all the main teachers, presenting those, 
harvesting uh, poetic renderings and artistic elaborations and beautiful ways of saying those technical things. And then also a debate before you've even come up with questions. So for each of the main topics within the stages of the path to enlightenment, he's done all this work for us, gathering all the main sources, all the main arguments, putting it scholastically, putting it poetically, presenting arguments you might have about it, and then moving on to the next section. It's an elegant text and it's available in English. So I really recommend doing classes on the Lam Rim Chenmo or the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment. But in any case, Lama Tsongkhapa is gonna be just the representative of the teacherness, even if you haven't made friends with him yet, <laughs> okay? Just think, all right, this is what the teacher is gonna look like for now. That's the first part of the visualization for this sadhana. And then at the heart of the guru is green Tara. So you're gonna see a lot of this in Tantra where there's stacking of visualization at the heart, at different points in the body, lots of stacking. And when you're doing this kind of work, remember that the visualization is three-dimensional and transparent made of light. So don't get too stuck on the solidity and make it confusing. So all of this so far is positioned at the crown of your head, facing the same direction as you. Lama Tsongkhapa, at his heart, is Green Tara. And then at her three places are Om, Ah, and Hum. And this is holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. And if you can't visualize them in Tibetan or in Sanskrit, you can visualize them in English or even just the three colors that's totally fine. The detail will build up as time goes by and as you kind of develop a relationship with these practices. And then at her heart is the syllable tam, which is the seed syllable of Tara. So as it says in the Sadhana, at her heart is a lotus and moon seat on which stands a radiant green syllable tam. Rays of green light radiate in all directions from the Tam and invoke all the enlightened beings of the 10 directions. They're all then absorbed into Tara and become one. Here's where we talk a little bit about this concept of invocation or invitation. It's kind of an interesting concept that you'll see in a few different forms in Tibetan Buddhism. Invocation is opening yourself up to the reality that's already there. So you visualize this beautiful visualization, even whether it's clear or it's not, it's beautiful and lovely, but part of you has a superstition that you made it up. It's just your imagination. And it's not just your imagination because you've conjured up the holy image, which comes from the holy mind. And also, the mind of the Buddhas pervades everywhere at all times. There is no portion of the universe where there is not the enlightened mind. So both the Buddhas were already here and you doing the visualization is kind of concentrating that connection. Now we're doing the invocation to invite all of the Buddhas to come and merge with what we visualized. So this is something that helps you break a lot of superstitions. Another superstition is Tara is not the same as other Buddhas with other qualities. I'm missing out. I'm only focused on Tara. Yeah. And that's a silly superstition, but one we might have. So you think all the Buddhas take the form of Tara and come and merge with the Tara that you visualized. So now she's supercharged, one in nature with all Buddhas, one in nature with all gurus right there at the crown of your head for you, directing her attention to you, which was already true. <laughs> but now you've developed a pathway or a bridge to experiencing that. So the Buddhas have been here the whole time, but what dictates our experience of them? It's our side. We have to purify and clear all of these obscurations and obstacles and tightness of heart and feelings of not being worthy or questions about the path. We have to do a lot of clearing to be able to feel the experience of the divine. 
So a lot of these practices are to just get you into the mode of deep receptivity. So you invoke all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They come and enter into the, the Buddha that you visualized, in this case, Tara. So this Tara is in miniature above the crown of your head. She faces the same direction as you. And then comes a purification process related to Tara. So from her crown to yours, white purifying light purifies the body. From her throat to yours, red light purifying the speech. From her heart to yours, blue light purifying the mind. So it's like this. So the Tara here isn't totally side on because I wanted you to be able to see the whole Tara, but feel that she's actually exactly the same direction as you as you meditate. And so in the sadhana, it will say, please bless me to purify all obscurations of my body so that it will become one in essence with Guru Tara's holy Vajra body. And then in response, Tara sends white light from the ohm at Tara's brow and curves in an arc to enter my brow. My body is purified completely of all obscurations and becomes one in essence with Guru Tara's holy Vajra body. And then similarly with speech, similarly with mind, and then all three together, which clear all of the subtle obscurations to omniscience. And after that, the guru dissolves into Aryatara. Remember, he's there, she's at his heart. Now he absorbs into her. So it's just her. And then green Aryatara herself melts into green light, which flows into me. And instantly you think that your wrong conceptions, that I and all other phenomena are self-existent, together with my dualistic mind and its view, disappears, becoming completely empty. Not even a trace of them remains. And then you concentrate one pointedly in this empty state, not like a vacuum, but empty of inherent existence, the spaciousness of infinite possibility, not nihilism, with the wisdom that is indistinguishably one with Guru Tara's blissful omniscient mind. So in a way, it's as if your mind and her mind merge. And then you arise as Tara yourself if you have the empowerment. If you don't have the empowerment, you visualize Tara reappears in the space in front of you, facing you. Okay, so you, you arise as Tara or Tara re-arises, but not on the crown, this time in front. And then you do the mantra recitation time. And the mantra is at uh, her, her, excuse me, her heart. And if it helps, you can just focus in on the mantra itself. Okay, so Tara's mantra is Om Tare Tutare Ture Soha. And it's moving here so you can see all the letters. But when you're doing the practice, the letters aren't moving when you're actually doing the recitation time. Light's going out, light comes back in, and the movement is actually the light. So those are the key components of the practice that we'll do in a moment. And all of that is within the sadhana itself, except for... Um, it's only in the very beginning in the kind of preamble to the text where it says what to do if you don't have the empowerment. If you do have the empowerment of Green Tara, then you just do the text as written. If you've not received a Green Tara Jainal or a Green Tara empowerment of any kind, whenever it says arising as Tara, you position her in the space in front and all of the things related to the self generation, you're doing with the front generation. Are there questions about that? It feels, does it feel clear enough to have a go? Um, so this is, I guess, just kind of a mischievous question. Um, so I always hear, you know, the guidance and I've never like not followed it, but you know, that you need the empowerment, you know, don't imagine them. And I just wonder like, is it just a respect thing? Is it just literally like, it wouldn't really matter if you imagined it, you know, mm. without the empowerment, so don't do it. Or is there actual like negative effect that could occur? 
It's uh, it's a good question, and it's it is cheeky, but it's important to ask. It's important to ask these questions. What happens is that when you take the empowerment, you connect to the unbroken oral tradition from the Buddha all the way to your present day guru. And there's a transmission of blessings and power and connection that comes through that, which doesn't happen if you just do it without the empowerment. So what can happen is if you did it without the empowerment, you might think this doesn't work. Yeah. And then you might think this practice is stupid. It doesn't work when actually you haven't given yourself enough conditions for it to work. One of the conditions is connecting with the unbroken oral tradition from the Buddha and that link and that transmission of blessings. So that's one reason. The other reason is, as you say, permission to practice is together with what an empowerment is. And so you're not given permission until you've taken the empowerment. That's the permission process. And so it's, it's kind of like, I don't know, being a little kid at the candy store and like just taking the candy as opposed to asking your mom, her saying yes, buying it and giving it to you in the correct portions, right? It's like, you'll still enjoy some kind of sweetness, but the guilt and shame and overeating will cause all sorts of problems, right? So if you don't have permission to practice, what can happen is that you don't understand about pacing and dosage. You don't have the same connection to hold you. And so you're just kind of out there in the wind by yourself, having a go. And it can create a lot of obstacles because you start to have the spiritual arrogance that thinks you can do this without connection. And that kind of arrogance creates a lot of obstacles to progress because part of you thinks you already know better. So there's no openings for you to connect more deeply or to seek out the commentaries that you need to continue on the path. The other piece is the connection with the real live human fleshy teacher in human form. And that human connection, that human transmission is something that moves your practice from like a hobby to a way of life. And that connection is almost beyond words but you do know the difference between, I don't know, when you were a child dreaming of your first date and then actually having your first date, right? The actual human connection is a totally different thing. Yeah. The human connection, good or bad, is, a, is something that we cannot fabricate. Maybe it's something we understand better now because of the pandemic. But having that human connection, even if you're one of a thousand people in a huge empowerment with his holiness, still that transmission of being in the room has kind of a kind of significance that's hard to put into words, but you definitely feel it when you're there. Yeah, so permission is one piece, but it's only one piece. Um, and if you have mistakenly done practices, um, seeing yourself as the deity before you were allowed to, just do some Vajrasattva and stop it. Yeah, don't get like weird about it. Don't get full of like guilt and heaviness and shame and trying to avoid telling anyone and all sorts of kind of like stuff about it. Just go, oh, whoops, I didn't realize or oh, whoops, I kind of realized I did the wrong thing. Let me purify and do it correctly from now on and just, you know, move on. Um, yeah, Lorna, go ahead. So I'm a little confused about empowerment. And so if I, I don't know if I've had empowerment, if I've did, like, let's say I did a workshop with uh, Ven Rabina on Green Tara, and she goes through all this stuff. Does that mean I have the empowerment to do that? Or I don't understand. Could you explain, please? Um, an empowerment is a very different set of things than a teaching. An empowerment is a ceremony, and it's very obviously a ceremony. Some teachers do teach a little bit within the empowerment itself and might tell you some things about the visualization. But for the most part, it is saffron water that has been blessed going around that you take sips of. It is various tantric implements coming around and bonking you on the head right? It is a whole mass of incense. There is a bunch of Damaru and Bell playing. There's mustard seeds being thrown. There's a lot, okay? There's a lot. 
And um, you probably wouldn't have missed it if you were at one. Yeah. Um, and it's different to a puja, which is also a ceremony with a whole bunch of noise, which is beautiful, but noisy. Um, it's different to a puja because the orientation is very obviously to the teacher during an empowerment. During a puja, there might be a teacher present that at various times the group kind of orients towards, but for the most part, they're just chanting together. In an initiation, everyone is directing all their attention to the person on the throne the whole time. And uh, usually it's a Tibetan Lama. Very rarely do Westerners have the qualifications to give empowerments. Yeah. Um, not that they couldn't if they develop those qualifications, but very few do. So it's going to be a Tibetan Lama, probably a boy one, um, although there's a few girl ones. What do it? Yeah. And that's just tradition. That's not anything about Buddhism being sexist. It's just the misogyny of the world is at play everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So the empowerment, it will be called a Wong or a Jainong or an empowerment or an initiation. All of those refer to a permission to practice. Um, a full empowerment is different than a Jainong. A Jainong is a subsequent permission, which is only a few hours long. A full empowerment is going to take a couple of days. So there'll be kind of a preliminary day and they'll give you um, a blessing cord like this that you'll wear around your upper arm to protect you from obstacles the night before, as well as some grass to sleep on. Like, I'm, I'm not saying Rabina couldn't do those things. I just feel like it's unlikely that she would have. She probably yeah, just- Yeah, no, she never did any of those things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So you shouldn't be doing these practices unless you've gotten the empowerment. Well, yes and no. It's it's the question of if it's a lower tantra empowerment or a lower tantra practice like Green Tara, you just don't see yourself as the deity if I you're see. directed to. Instead, you visualize the deity. The deity. You visualize her in front, right? Okay. In front. Oh, okay. Yep. I understand. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, and same with Medicine Buddha. Like Medicine Buddha Puja, there's no portion where you explicitly arise as Medicine Buddha, so you don't have to worry about it. But Medicine Buddha Sadhana, even though it's shorter and simpler, there's a section where all the Medicine Buddhas dissolve into you and you arise as Medicine Buddha. Don't do that. <laughs> Just position him in the space in front. Yeah, so it's a positional thing. And once you have empowerments, you can learn about what is it to arise as the deity, why do you arise as the Buddha? What's all of that about? But until that point, just position them in the space in front. Yeah, I have a couple question. Could you um, talk about different colors of Tara and um, what they mean? And are they all lower Tantra category? And also, um, um, okay, I'll wait for that. Uh, well, the, tw the 21 Taras um, are related to Chidamani Tara, who is highest yoga tantra, but we can do the puja together, even if you don't have the empowerment, that's okay. So we'll go through each one of those 21, which are different colors. Um, we'll go through each one tomorrow. Yep, one by one. Yep. Um, so pujas are different than sadhanas. Pujas there are fewer parts where you explicitly arise as the deity. And when that happens, you just don't, unless you have the empowerment. Just skip that part. The chant leader has it covered for you. Yeah. And in sadhanas, which are usually done by yourself, if you're doing a practice like that, a sadhana, and it says arise as the deity, don't. Yeah, know that that's for people with the empowerment and position the deity in the space in front instead. Um, was that your question or did you have a different question than that? Um, if we ever um, give an empowerment, do we need to, um, to arise as a deity? If we don't really... Um, know what's going on <laughs> will we just happen <laughs> to receive empowerment oh i see yeah um 
if you've received an empowerment and you really haven't studied Tantra a lot and you feel uncomfortable um, to do the practice as written, it's okay to keep putting them in the space in front. Although um, there is a lot of benefit to just trying and seeing what happens and gradually looking for good commentaries because there are a lot of good ones in many languages or to request your Dharma center to teach on a specific deity is a really good idea. Even if they say no, because it creates the cause karmically. So if there is a practice that you have an empowerment for, but you don't know how to do it, do ask your Dharma center to do a class on it or a group practice on it. Yeah. So you have permission to practice when you have the empowerment. You are kind of also expected to try to do the practice. Otherwise, why did you take it? Yeah. Um, but it could be that like many of us, you just stumbled into an empowerment and had no idea what was going on and only found out what it was after the fact. So if that happened, don't worry, just take it again with fresh eyes when you feel ready. Yeah. Yeah. So just gently, gently. Yeah, other um, Tantra questions, particularly lower Tantra questions. In Tibetan Buddhism, we usually practice the lowest Tantra and the highest Tantra, but the two middle ones aren't usually practiced in our tradition, uh, with the exception being kind of Kunrig. Um, but uh, it's basically, you're practicing lower Tantra practices like Medicine Buddha, Green Tara, Chen Rezig, Man, uh, Orange Manjushri, they're to help you clear obstacles, they're to help you have a healthy long life with the proviso that you want a healthy long life in order to practice. Yeah. And in order to practice what? Highest Yoga Tantra. So you've entered into the tantric vehicle, even with those kind of basic lower tantra deities. And a lot of their practices have a lot going on behind the scenes of the practice that isn't explicitly written in the written text that you need to go ahead and find commentaries to to learn more about. Yeah, Mary Ellen, go ahead. Can you tell just looking at a tanka whether or not you're looking at a highest yoga tantra deity and uh, or an action tantra deity? Often, but not always. Yeah, often, but not always. There are a few highest yoga tantra images, which you wouldn't know that they were. I mean, the most obvious being Chittamani Tara. What is the difference between green Tara's image and Chittamani Tara's image? Green Tara has one flower, Chittamani Tara has two. But you wouldn't know that, you know, like unless he's, you know, so it's often confusing. You don't know what you're looking at, but with a lot of highest yoga tantra deities, there are more arms, there are more people, there's more going on, there's a lot. <laughs> With lower tantra deities, they're usually simpler, they're usually sweeter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when you're seeing iconography that is confusing in Tibetan Buddhism, remember that it's about intimidating negative states of mind by not being afraid of those negative states of mind, transforming the energy that accompanies those negative states of mind, on the path. But that means that you've already developed some faculty with applying the antidotes to them. So you're not messing around with things that you don't have any control over yet. You're starting to work with the energy that accompanies strong negative emotions, but you're really intimidating the strong negative emotion by adopting different aspects. So highest yoga tantra, um, like all Tantra, but particularly highest yoga Tantra, you need to very much understand renunciation, the determination to be free. You very much need to understand bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, and you very much need to understand the correct view, the wisdom realizing emptiness. So the three principal aspects of the path are vital for you to understand, agree with, and attempt <laughs> before practicing any class of Tantra. If you don't understand those three, just study them more, right? <laughs> if you're not sure if you practice those three, just work on it, right? And if you've taken tantric empowerments prior to studying those three, work on it now, <laughs> okay? So the three principal aspects of the path are essential components of tantra, and it's even woven into 
all of their iconography. You've noticed that all deities are either sitting or standing on a lotus, a sun and a moon disc. And either the moon disc is most obvious or the sun disc is most obvious, but they're always standing or sitting on those three. And those three represent renunciation, bodhicitta and correct view. So good fun facts. Let's have a um, 20 minute break, Mary Ellen. Does that make sense? Okay, yep, 20 minutes and then we'll do the practice.